I want to welcome you all to this press conference of local and state officials. I'm John Cavana, and I'm director of the Institute for Policy Studies. And today I announce to you that with the recent addition of Santa Fe, New Mexico, that 300 towns, cities, and states have passed resolutions against the Iraq War. Uh, Among these, in 17 states across this country, state legislatures have passed anti-war resolutions or sent letters against the war to the president. These 17 states represent 126 million people in this country. The cities and towns represent another 26 million people. In other words, around half of this country of 300 million people, through their local and state officials, have said no to this war. These are the cities and towns where young men and women who have been killed in Iraq were born and went to school. And these are the cities and towns where schools are not being built because tax dollars are funding an immoral and illegal war. All across America, democracy is speaking out against this war. And as you are about to hear, their appeal is urgent, is compelling, and is diverse. You will hear from five local and state officials with brief statements. Then you'll have time to ask questions. And then all of us here, and you're invited to join us, will march to the White House to present copies of the resolutions. And I have copies here of all of the resolutions of the cities that are taking part and present them to the president. First, I want to present to you Karen Dolan, the director of Cities for Peace, the program at the Institute for Policy Studies, which has coordinated this day. Karen Dolan. Thank you all for coming. I'm not from Cleveland, Ohio, but uh, one of our uh, councilmen from Cleveland, Ohio, at the last moment had a family emergency, so I want him represented here. <laughs> I, as John said, I'm Karen Dolan. I'm the Director of Cities for Peace, a project of the Institute for Policy Studies. And we, along with our endorsers, after Downing Street, AF American Friends Service Committee, Backbone Campaign, Code Pink, Hip Hop Caucus, Michigan Peace Works, National Priorities Project, Peace Action, Progressive Democrats of America, South Mountain Peace Action, United for Peace and Justice, U.S. Labor Against the War, Vermont Network on Iraq Resolutions, Wisconsin Network for Peace and Justice, we all welcome you to this historic event. With, o with over 300 official statements from elected officials, we have over half of the nation saying that it's time to end this misguided war, to stop the senseless killing, to bring our soldiers home, and to redirect our hard-earned taxpayer money into our own communities for real security. Cities for Peace seeks to assist elected officials, soccer moms, ballet dads, our sisters and our brothers in the peace movement, military families, religious communities, and others in voicing and in hearing the wisdom from City Hall on matters of foreign policy. Yes, from City Hall on matters of foreign policy, especially the wrong-headed policy that has brought us the tragedy of the Iraq War. You will hear testimony from Main Street USA that is far more coherent, just, and smart about how to achieve a sense of security here at home and as a nation at home in a global society. It's my hope that as the federal government continues to lead us down a path of failure and injustice, that City Hall and State House will be our direct voice for a saner foreign policy to end this war. Thank you. We're going to start with the leader of our delegation today, a very dynamic alderman from Chicago, Joe Moore, who led efforts in that city both before the war and since the war, and has helped that city council pass resolutions against the war. Joe Moore. Thank you, John. It's uh, good to be here with so many uh, uh, people who are in the vanguard in the fight for uh, peace and justice. Um, as John said, my name is Joe Moore, and I'm a member of the uh, 
City Council of the City of Chicago, a proud city for peace. Four and one half years ago, I, I stood in this very room with local elected officials, uh, many of whom are with me here again today, from across our great land, from small towns to big cities, to oppose President Bush's plan for preemptive war against Iraq. At that time, Chicago had joined with 160 other cities and towns across our nation in adopting resolutions against the impending war. Together, we marched shoulder to shoulder to the White House on that cold February day to give to President Bush our resolutions, calling upon him to refrain from that unnecessary and unjust war. We did not believe that our president had made the case for war. We did not believe he had justified placing our city's sons and daughters in harm's way. We did not believe he had justified the expenditure of hundreds of billions of dollars in that war, money that was needed to educate our children, house our families, care for our elderly, and police our streets. We did not believe his claim that the war was necessary to make us more secure. Indeed, we feared it would make our world less secure and our cities more vulnerable to terrorist attack. Tragically, the president did not heed our call. He took our nation into war, and our worst fears were realized. Our nation today is no more secure. In fact, we are less secure. The war has served as a recruiting tool for al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. At the same time, the misuse of our National Guards and reservists in this misbegotten war has greatly undermined our ability at the state and local level to respond to natural and man-made disasters. Over 3,500 of our nation's finest young men and women have died. Over 25,000 have been wounded, with many suffering grievous physical and emotional injuries. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqis have been killed and injured. The financial costs are staggering. The war has cost our nation over a half trillion dollars. According to the Nonpartisan National Priorities Project, taxpayers in my city, Chicago, alone have paid over $4.8 billion to finance this war. That represents over two-thirds of Chicago's entire budget for a year. Put in very local terms, the taxpayers in my ward, the 49th Ward of Chicago, have spent over $96 million on this war. That is money that could have been used to improve my local schools, create hundreds of units of much-needed affordable housing, build another community center to provide a safe haven for my neighborhood's kids, and hire additional police officers to patrol our streets. In short, this war has ra robbed my colleagues and me of the resources needed to improve the quality of life in our communities. That's what brings us to Washington here today. We are beseeching our leaders to end this illegal and unjustified war and bring our troops home now. Over 300 states, cities, and towns have called for an end to this war through resolutions, referenda, and mayoral proclamations. We represent large cities and small towns, urban centers and rural areas, the north, the south, the east, the west, from Aeroswick, Maine to West Palm Beach, Florida, from Boston, Massachusetts to Bellingham, Washington. We are the elected officials closest to the people. These resolutions, referenda, and proclamations represent the will of the American people, average citizens from all walks of life who are unalterably opposed to the Bush administration's war in Iraq and, pro and are profoundly disappointed in Congress's inability to end this war. We cannot remain silent as our national leaders allow this war to continue indefinitely. We cannot remain silent as our city's young men and women are sent to die in this senseless war. We cannot remain silent as our scarce financial resources are squandered in an unnecessary and disastrous foreign military adventure while our cities and towns are told to fend for themselves. Mr. President, members of Congress, hear the plea of the elected officials closest to the people. Let's bring our brave men and women home. Let's end this war now. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. We now turn from the giant city of Chicago with its three million people to a medium-sized city, West Palm Beach, Florida. We're very pleased to have with us Mayor Lois Frankel, who was a co-sponsor of a resolution 
passed by the U.S. Conference of Mayors last month. Lois Frankel from West Palm Beach. Thank you very much. Good morning, and uh, th thank you, uh, Joe, for really setting the stage. There's so many reasons to oppose this war, and uh, we're here to highlight those uh, reasons that really affect us so deeply in terms of the infrastructure in our cities. And, you know, our country, there's a long history of being willing to sacrifice during wartime, uh, losing sons and daughters, uh, tightening the belt at home. Uh, but I call this war in Iraq the war for nothing. I cannot understand, as many of you here and many Americans, uh, why we went in uh, and why we are still there. Uh, but let me, let me uh, not talk necessarily about numbers, but talk to you about people. Uh. Uh, in West Palm Beach, uh, there's a couple that lives in the northern part of my city. Th their name are Ida and John. Uh, they are 90 years old. Uh, John has Alzheimer's. Ida is so frail, she's unable to cook, and she's unable to shop. They have outlived their family and friends. Uh, they are one of a 1,000 people in my community who are waiting for a federal program called Meals on Wheels, a lifeline to bring food to their house. Imagine that in the United States of America, being 90 years old and waiting for food. Uh, or how about the single mother who's raising uh, two children, and she's a nurse's aide. And she also is one of 900 people in my city who are on a waiting list for public housing. And, you know, these stories can go on and go on and go on. Um, my city alone, my, my mid-sized city of 100,000 plus people uh, have already paid $122 million in our taxes towards this war, $122 million, which I respectfully suggest of could have done so, such... Uh, m m much more productive things uh, like providing health care or housing or teachers, uh, tuition for, for students. So I am very pleased to be here and add my voice and thank the other local officials and, uh, and cities for peace for, for being here. And, and uh, I, you know, as I leave today, as I walk around Congress, I'm, I'll tell you one of the questions I'm going to ask is, I want to know if a Katrina hits West Palm Beach, and my, my city had three hurricanes in the last two years. If Katrina hits West Palm Beach, will the National Guard be in Baghdad, or is it going to be in my city? Um, this war is not worth our sacrifice and uh, that our people are being forced to make, and it's time to end our occupation of Iraq. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. Both Lois and Joe mentioned the local costs of war. We, we do have with us here as well, and he can answer questions when we get to the questions and answers. Greg Speeder, who's the head of the National Priorities Project that does those terrific calculations on the local and state costs of war. We're now going to shift to a state. I mentioned there were 17 states where at least one chamber has passed a resolution against the war, or legislators have signed letters against the war. We're, we're going from um, the big now to the little, the, the 49th state in terms of population, Vermont, which symbolizes something very important about this war, which is the disproportionate burden that has been paid by small rural towns in terms of casualties in this war. Uh, Vermont has been at the forefront of the opposition, uh, both passing a referenda, and we'll get into the referenda in a moment, but also passing a very powerful resolution from both state, uh, both the state and uh, the, the Senate and the House of Vermont. And we're pleased to have Michael Fisher from the Vermont State House. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, yes, I am proud that Vermont stands as one of the states who has made a clear statement saying enough, saying it's time to bring our troops home immediately and in an orderly fashion. 
Um, again, my name is Mike Fisher. I've been a state representative for seven years. I'm going into my eighth year. Last week, I spent a day with a number of Vermont Guard troops uh, during their training at Fort Drum in upstate New York. I went because I thought it was important for me to look into the eyes of these young men and women and to hear about what it is uh, they are living with and what it is they're expecting. I come to report to you um, that these men and women are, are learning to do their best. They are learning to be professionals and to do a job. Um, they don't ask questions about why they're asked to do one thing or another. They follow their orders. I have great pride in the Vermont Guard. Excuse my, uh, I, might not, I might be biased, but I think they're the best. It's unbelievable to me that this administration continues to send these young men and women to Iraq and men, like, men and women like them from other states to be a part of trying to police or manage this civil and sectarian war. I can't believe it. Last year, the Vermont House uh, and Senate passed a resolution calling for the orderly withdrawal of American military forces to commence immediately. Um, we passed it by a strong margin. I had introduced the same resolution for three years in a row. Uh, it became popular, and we were able to pass it, and I'm proud of that. We strive in Vermont and, and in other small states to be responsive to the needs of our vulnerable citizens and our hardworking citizens. We see the regular withdrawal of the federal government's financial supports that help us keep our infrastructure sound and our safety net well, well, our safety net well mended. And we see a very expensive and damaging war that will not make us safer at home and will not make us safer abroad. Uh, like many of you, I think, behind me, I have had the experience of sitting in constituents' living rooms and talking about the loss, of their, the, the loss of their loved son or daughter. I've tried to console these moms and dads as they've asked, why my son? Why was he in Iraq? Why are we still in Iraq? I don't have an answer for them. I come back to the young men and women I visited with in Fort Drum last week. The human cost of this war is far too high. The, co the outcome is far too damaging. So uh, I'll, I'll end again by saying Vermont stands, um, stands strong. 57 towns have passed resolutions opposing the war. The House has passed a resolution opposing it. The Senate has passed a resolution opposing it and I uh, appreciate the time to speak. Thank you. In this incredible upsurge of democracy against the war around the country, four states have done something quite remarkable, which is they've put referenda on their ballots uh, to pass at the local level uh, referenda against the war. You just heard uh, Michael refer to the one in Vermont, also Massachusetts, also Illinois, and also Wisconsin. We have people here who participated in those remarkable campaigns from each of the states. Um, from Wisconsin, we, we have uh, both George Martin here and we have uh, Steve Burns, and I'm going to ask Steve Burns to come forward and say a few words about the effort in Wisconsin. <laughs> Witness the changeover. Uh, to date, uh, 42 Wisconsin cities and towns and villages have voted on the question of the war in Iraq. Um, I didn't bring 42 signs with me. What I brought with me is a sign for White, Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, and I'm, I brought that on behalf of a good friend of mine named Chuck Bainton, who wanted to be here and couldn't be. Um, in 2006, Wisconsin Network for Peace and Justice joined with more than 30 Wisconsin uh, churches, labor organizations, peace groups, uh, to help local citizens in Wisconsin to collect the thousands of signatures needed to put a Bring Our Troops Home initiative on their local ballot. And in April 2006, 34 of those initiatives, uh, 34 of those communities voted on those questions, and all but eight of those initiatives passed. 
Uh, of the 24 communities in April 2006 that voted for immediate withdrawal from Iraq, six of those were communities that voted for George W. Bush in the 2004 election. Uh, the small town of Draper, Wisconsin, which voted 58% for George W. Bush, voted 65% for an initiative calling for the immediate withdrawal of all U.S. forces from Iraq, beginning with the National Guard and Reserves. The little Door, Count, Door County community of Luxembourg, which voted 63 percent for George W. Bush in the 2004 election, voted for immediate withdrawal from Iraq. And with, the, with these initiatives, uh, the people of Wisconsin showed that they are far ahead of the people in Washington who claim to represent them. In November, 10 more Wisconsin communities, including the city of Milwaukee, joined in this effort, and they were joined by 48 other communities in Illinois and Massachusetts. You'll hear about them as well. And on the November ballot of 58 citizen initiatives uh, calling for withdrawal from Iraq, not a single initiative failed. People in Wisconsin want a withdrawal from Iraq which begins immediately, is quick, and is complete. And what we hear from people in Washington is withdrawal that begins eventually, is gradual, and is partial. And I've come here to Washington to say to my elected officials, when will you catch up to the people you claim to represent? Now, we've heard about the local cost of war. Uh, in Wisconsin on Thursday, we lost the 77th member of the armed forces uh, who came from Wisconsin to this war. Um, I'd like to speak briefly about one of those 77. Uh, Mark Maida graduated from Memorial High School in Madison, Wisconsin um, in 2001, and shortly thereafter joined the U.S. Army. Uh, in October 2004, he was scheduled to return home, having served his three-year commitment to the Army. At that time, the Army implemented its stop-loss policy, keeping Mark in Iraq. In May 26, uh, 2005, uh, Mark was killed by a um, roadside bomb about 30 miles south of uh, Baghdad. And I know about Mark because Mark's father, Ray, a retired Madison, uh, city of Madison police detective, and Mark's brother, Chris, who is a Marine who also served in Iraq, came out to speak in public in support of the citizens in their community, Madison, Wisconsin, who were collecting thousands of signatures to place a Bring Our Troops Home initiative on their local ballot. And uh, Mark's father came out to speak. Um, he talked about um, how Mark had turned against the war while he was in Iraq and that Mark had made an agreement with a friend of his who was also serving that when they got back to the United States, they would be at every single Bring Our Troops Home event that they could find. Um, and Ray came out and spoke because he said um, that he felt he had to speak because he, he thought that uh, Mark had been silenced. Um, Ray said something else that I, I don't think I'll ever forget. He talked about how Mark had been recently promoted to sergeant uh, shortly before his death and the sense of responsibility that Mark felt uh, for the men and women is in his command. Um, and he felt, Mark felt a sense of responsibility to make sure that those men, men and women got back alive. And Ray said that he supported this initiative, the Bring Our Troops Home initiative, because he felt that our goal was Mark's goal. Our goal, as Mark's was, uh, was to bring them home alive. I think it's something we simply have to do. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more official before we open up to your questions. Um, we've done states. We've had a big city, medium-sized city. Now we turn to one of the smaller cities, uh, Maplewood, New Jersey, a, a, a town of about 24,000. And we have here both the mayor, but speaking now will be city council member Vic DeLuca. Thank you, John. I bring you greetings from Maplewood, New Jersey, and want to recognize South Mountain Peace Action, a uh, group that's working with us over the last uh, years to keep us honest and keep us to do the, make us do the right thing. The cost of the war for our 24,000 residents totals almost $84 million, roughly $3,500 for every man, woman, and child in town. The human cost is even more tragic. We've lost friends and family members, some who have graduated our schools and gone on. And those, those loss will never be replaced. I stand here today with elected officials yeah.
from across the country calling for an end to military operations in Iraq. It is time, in fact, it is past time to bring the troops home, back to their communities, communities that we represent as elected officials. In 2003, the Maplewood Township Committee passed a resolution calling on President Bush to refrain from acts of war against Iraq. And in January of this year, we were the first local government in our state to call for a planned, orderly, and rapid withdrawal of all military personnel. We stand sh shoulder to shoulder with the hundreds of rural, urban, and suburban communities, large cities, and small hamlets, which have expressed an anti-war sentiment. Now, by New Jersey standards, Maplewood is a medium-sized suburban community. We are not faced with the tremendous pressures associated with the poverty found in our neighboring communities to the east, such as Newark and Irvington, nor do we enjoy the wealth of the towns in the western suburban beltways. But the one thing we do share in common with all communities in our state and across the United States is that this war is hurting our people. It is taking tax dollars from their pockets and supporting national priorities that are misguided. These priorities support a war machine at the expense of human needs. In our community, like others, our citizens need affordable health care, senior citizen housing and social services, and a well-funded education system. Instead, we in Maplewood are faced with increasing costs and already crushing property taxes, necessitating 2007 budget cuts in police, fire, and sanitation services, and school personnel. As the mayor said, what kind of country is this where we fund war at the expense of services like that? This coming September, our Board of Education will begin a school year with an annual budget of about $94 million for the 6,200 students in our system. Total federal aid to our school is now less than 2%. One of every $9 that we spend on education, we spend to educate students with special needs. The laws are already on the books. If the President and Congress met the goal of the Federal Individuals with Disability Education Act, which say provide 40% of the cost of educating students, a human priority, it would mean millions more for our schools and the schools in all of our communities, providing resources that we need to maintain a high-quality system and helping to lessen the burden on our taxpayers. For our seniors, we sadly have to tell them that there is no funding to build affordable housing that will allow them to remain in the community that they built for families facing a layoff and the loss of health insurance, they come to us and talk about the real choices they have to make between providing health services for their children and meeting other real life needs of keeping together a household. There are countless other examples of how spending for this war crowds out human priorities. After our vote in January on the resolution, the state's largest newspaper wrote an editorial supporting our right to make a statement. The Star-Ledger wrote, Maplewood's vote was a proper expression of local sentiment on a serious issue, something that small towns have done since colonial times in America. Well, we are gratified to be here today among so many activists and so many elected officials representing our township in this grassroots effort to influence the federal government's misdirected foreign and domestic policies and to send the message to end this war now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's now time to open up the question to the floor. Any questions you might...